Hello everyone. In this video, I'm going to discuss some of the elements of our online learning environment and then provide you with background information regarding Othello. You can use this information to better understand the sections of the text that you have to read for next week, the first week of our actual online learning environment, the classes that I'll be delivering. First of all, throughout this experience, for however long we engage in this online learning environment, lectures are going to be posted on YouTube. So the primary means of interaction between teachers and students, as I have uh, indicated in the video that I posted earlier on, is going to be through Mio, Announcements in Omnivox, and the Omnivox Forum. But as we are engaging with each other, answering, answering questions, um, addressing various different topics through those media, uh, I am also going to be posting lectures. Assignments will be appearing periodically in the Omnivox Forum and on Turnitin.com. So, keep an eye on the Assignments tab in Omnivox, so you can see if any new small assignments have been posted. Look to the forum for uh, in-class work assignments or those that would parallel what we would be doing in class for grades. And then look at turnitin.com to see if new assignments that have to be submitted through the website are appearing there. If you don't know how to sign into turnitin.com, please review the Mio that I sent out about a about a week ago now, wherein I provide you with the access password and uh, the classroom key. Today's lecture in this video is going to be about Othello's historical background and some key terms and ideas that we'll use to begin to understand Shakespeare's cultural context and the ideas or issues that he's exploring in his work. We also have uh, two Zoom meetings scheduled for next week. These Zoom meetings are an opportunity for you to connect with me directly, to ask me any questions that you might have, to talk about the text, if you wish. I'm really keeping that time open for consultations and conversations. So I would invite all of you to attend those, mess those meetings um, so that if people do have questions, you can have the benefit of hearing the answers to them. But those two meetings are going to be scheduled for the Wednesday-Friday section on Friday, April the 3rd at 10 a.m. In other words, our regular class time. For the Tuesday-Thursday section of this course, it will be at uh, 3 o'clock on April the 2nd, so again, our regular class time. Through those two class periods, I'll be holding those meetings. Again, we can use those to discuss the text, we can use those to answer questions that you might have, to go over different sections of the texts. Um, it will be a little bit unusual and it'll be a bit of a learning experience, uh, a feeling out process because obviously none of us have really used Zoom for this purpose before, and it might get a little bit unwieldy uh, when you have maybe 30 people in that meeting. So what I'll do is mute everyone when they first come in, I'll say a few things to you, and then uh, I will ask you to sort of signal me uh, to ask for uh, the opportunity to speak. And uh, we'll go into more detail regarding that when we set up the Zoom meeting. So that's everything that you have to know about our plans moving forward and the intentions behind this video. In terms of Othello, this play was likely written around 1603. However, the play is likely set around 1550 to 1565. Shakespeare is looking back at his own relatively recent history, or the relatively recent history of his nation and the world, and drawing from historical events that I'll describe in more detail in a minute. The basic premise of this play is that Othello is a general of Venice. So he's a Venetian general tasked with the defense of the city and its, its holdings. In fact, Venice has a kind of a mercantile empire. He is a racial outsider. He's a black man living in a predominantly white society. So Shakespeare has chosen this text to start exploring the racial context of his day. And you can think back to some of what we discussed when we studied the poem, We Wear the Mask. Are there going to be some parallels between We Wear the Mask, this idea of the false front projecting an identity that is not your own, that we see playing out in Shakespeare's reflections on the racial issue? Venice views itself as a kind of paragon of luxury and culture, spreading civility throughout the world. 
The nation is quite powerful, and it's a center of trade. It's a trade hub. Venice, however, at this point in history, not in 1603, but in 1550, 1565, is at war with Turkey or the Ottoman Empire. So in the play, you've probably heard the word Ottomites. Ottomites are just um, the actual citizens of the Ottoman Empire. Much of the play centers on the defense of Cyprus against a Turkish invasion. Cyprus is a major port for Venice, and it's kind of a defensive bulwark against piracy and uh, aggression from the Turks. And when we look at a map of the region involved, you'll actually see why that would be the case. We know this play has to be set before 1571, because in 1571, the Turks actually successfully capture Cyprus. Venice, after this point, will start to decline as a regional power. A few basic notes regarding kind of stereotypical views in Shakespeare's era, and particularly in the Venetian era, uh, nation, as they are thinking about themselves and the rest of the world in the context of the history that Shakespeare is exploring. First, many of the Europeans and many of the Venetians in this story would view Turkey as a place of barbarism and savagery. It is not a Christian nation, it's a nation, it is a heathen nation. So there's a cultural, racial, and religious divide between Turkey and Venice. And as a result, they view Turkey as a place of unbridled violence and animality. Venice, on the other hand, is the exact opposite. We talked a little bit about this delineation between animal and human, civilization and savagery. And we said that Shakespeare's audience would have recognized that there wasn't a stark division between the two. Instead, there was a kind of series of gradations or a spectrum between humanity and animality, and that depending on one's actions and even one's place in the world, you could negotiate your position on that spectrum, becoming more or less human. Venice would be this bastion of civility and humanity of Christianity. Again, I'm not making moral judgments here or pronouncements. I'm just talking about the cultural presumptions that these uh, groups and that Shakespeare's audience in turn might have had. And we'll see the degree to which Shakespeare adheres to these stereotypes and conventions or whether he rejects them. Cyprus is an island between Turkey and Venice. So it operates in this liminal space between civilization and savagery. So if you want to talk about those gradations, you're, as you move into Cyprus, as you move closer to Turkey, you are in the Elizabethan mind or in the Venetian mind, moving closer to incivility. One of the key terms and key concepts from this play is the notion of turning Turk. Turning Turk literally means converting from Christianity to Islam. But it is a metaphor in the play and in the common parlance of Shakespeare's era for a conversion to savagery or savage practices. You are rejecting the, um, the, involved, the evolved, enlightened vision of the Western European mindset. Now, turning Turk also has another kind of connotation. In this era, it was quite common for white people to be taken as slaves. Europe, during Shakespeare's time, is beset by the Barbary slave trade or the Barbary pirates. They're going around coastal villages, capturing white people as slaves, taking them back to generally Arab nations and selling them off. Turning Turk was also used to describe forced conversions of these slaves who converted to Islam in order to avoid harsh treatment by their masters. Also, many women who were taken as slaves and forced to bear children would convert to Islam so that they could interact with those children who were raised as Muslims. Here we have a map of the region in which we, about which we are concerned um, around 1575. You see here um, that you have the Ottoman Empire or Turkey in purple. Cyprus is this island right here. It's the island over which the characters in this play are going to be fighting or that Othello is going to attempt to defend. Venice is here. By this point, 1575, much of the Venetian Empire has begun to contract. They've already lost Cyprus. 
So Othello and the play start out here in Venice, and he is called in Act One, Scene Two, to go to um, Cyprus in order to defend it from a Turkish fleet that's heading there. The Turks have made for roads, so they're making it seem like they're going to attack another uh, holding of the Republic of Venice. However, their true intention is to attack Cyprus. So Othello is dispatched from Venice. He travels with his wife Desdemona and his ancient, his ensign Iago, his lieutenant Michael Cassio, and they all end up in Cyprus to lead its defense against the Turks. Othello himself is a Moor. This term is fraught and complex. It can mean many different things depending on the time and the context. By Shakespeare's era, it had come to mean uh, generally a black man. So it was a generalized term for a black man. It's not a derogatory term. However, uh, when Iago appropriates it and turns it into his moorship, it likely is intended as such. Originally, it was a reference to a group of people from a particular African nation, the natives of Mauritania. However, by Shakespeare's period, again, it uh, became this generalized concept. However, when people heard it, they still had lingering connotations or lingering associations with the, uh, the Arabic and the Islamic. We also have to understand something about Shakespeare's particular era, the Elizabethan era, the time at which Shakespeare is writing this play, and their views, his culture's views, on black people or on Moors. Because he's dealing with two things. First, the treatment of Othello and the treatment of African, I was going to say African Americans, but obviously they're not, treatment of Moors, um, in the uh, context of Venice and the 1550s, 1560s. But he's also thinking about contemporary events. So he's using this historical narrative in order to grapple with issues that he is addressing in his particular time period and respond to sociological developments in that moment. In Elizabethan England, there was a kind of commingled fascination with and concern over the foreign nature of the Moors that were living in England. This was largely due, in part, to the influx of slaves into Europe and also uh, the Barbary piracy that I mentioned beforehand. So you're looking at this group of individuals, or the Elizabethans were looking at this group of individuals, and viewing them through the lens of their concerns regarding foreign piracy and also their sense of civil responsibility. Because most of these slaves were not slaves to England. They were liberated slaves that England had captured from the Spanish. So at this moment in time, uh, or just prior to the, the composition of this play, you have a kind of trade war going on between England and Spain. And one of the ways that England or uh, the United Kingdom, Britain, is trying to interfere with Spanish operations is by raiding their slave ships and taking the slaves that were uh, captured on board them and liberating them, freeing them. So you had these newly liberated slaves beginning to pour into England. England is in a tense and uncertain position. However, uh, these freed slaves are not the only Moors in England. Throughout Europe, you had black artisans and musicians. Uh, you had entirely freed black men who were born free and uh, had all the rights of a white citizen. They could vote, they could marry white women, or a black woman could marry a white man. There are numerous cases of both occurring. Of course, uh, opinions varied depending on location and experience. Uh, cities were oftentimes uh, hubs of activity, so you had more chance of encountering um, a, someone from a different race. Uh, in rural areas, you had less opportunity to do so. So obviously, opinions, perspectives on the world, experiences would change depending on location, depending on time period, depending on the issues that were arising in that moment. However, there was in these sort of uh, uh, city centers a general kind of acceptance for blacks. They had equal protection under the law, they could own property, and they could essentially go into any position or field. So there's a kind of, for 
from our perspective, radical equality or egalitarianism in operation in, uh, at this point in English history. Now, obviously, this is an oversimplification. Things change. Things are different in different periods of time. But as a general overarching view, uh, the status of black Moors or Moors in England um, was, again, remarkably egalitarian. Well, again, we are dealing with a patriarchal system here. Uh, the status of women was much the same. From 1558 to 1603, you had England ruled by Queen Elizabeth. That's why we refer to this period as the Elizabethan era. Queen Elizabeth was known as the Virgin Queen because she was unmarried. So she ruled this entire nation for almost 40 years while being unmarried. In this era, when looking at it in its context, thinking about it in comparison to eras that preceded it and followed it, um, there was a kind of liberation for women, at least far more so than in previous eras. Many women were able to secure employment outside of the home, although they were limited in the kinds of jobs that they could receive and the education that they were, could receive. So although they could be tutored inside a home, they couldn't go to university. Many of the women in lower classes had the opportunity to marry, at least, uh, at least some opportunity to marry, uh, the individuals of their own choosing. In highborn society, however, no such marriages were possible. Whether you were a man or a woman, you had a duty to marry for the benefit of your family. And oftentimes these marriages were arranged well beforehand. When we think about marital relations themselves, Marriages obviously were headed by the husband. So if we think about that hierarchical, despotic organization of the household that we discussed in relation to the private sphere of human existence, this is kind of what we're talking about. Husbands did have a place of authority inside the home and inside the family. However, there were laws that prevented cruelty to women. Uh, so abuse, uh, neglect, or any kind of malfeasance or mistreatment could be brought before a court of law and appropriately punished. Did this always work out in practice as it uh, would work out on paper? Not necessarily. But um, at this point in time, we are moving towards a more egalitarian, more open, more fair society. Again, judging from our own standards of today, it's an oppressive civilization. However, if we think about it relative to all the uh, nations prior to this point, the treatment of women up until this time in history, it's a fairly open and liberated society. The next term that I'd like to discuss with you, or the next issue that I'd like to discuss with you, is the notion of a folio. Oftentimes, when you look at the marginal notes for the edition of Shakespeare that I requested that you purchase, you'll see notes like F1 or G2. These are notes on the folio editions of Shakespeare's text that we have. Folios are essentially um, stitched collections of expansive pages. So if you look on the screen, you have this uh, piece of paper or piece of vellum that has been folded in four sections. What they would do is take this large sheet of vellum or paper, run it through the printing press, producing uh, essentially eight different pages on this one sheet, and then they would fold it in four. They would then cut the top so that you remove the fold, and then stitch together multiple different sections of those little folios, creating uh, bound collections of essentially eight pages. So you'd have maybe 10 eight-page sections bound together in one collection. When you see G1 or F2, whatever might be the case, they're referring to different collections of the play. These collections, or these versions of the play, have slight or minute differences between them largely because the printing process is not exact. You might have a letter key that's been misplaced. So the I and the L look remarkably similar. So as the printer is uh, producing this copy of the text, maybe he took the L instead of the I. Or maybe the crossbar on the T is broken. So when they put the T in, what should have been a T um, as it appeared on the page actually looks like an L. So there are slight differences between these various different manuscripts. Sometimes these differences can be equally reasonable. 
a word could be changed in some way that in either case makes sense. So we are today unsure as to the appropriate original Shakespearean dialogue or Shakespearean line. That's why in those marginal notes they say, well, in this version, the text says this. In this other version, the text says something else. These are minute differences, uh, but you should be aware of this fact. Typically, these textual variations or textual variants uh, don't introduce any extensive differences, but they are there and they are something to note. And then on the slides on Omnivox, you have a little note regarding folios. That concludes the introductory background lecture on Othello. There's a great deal of information there to assimilate. And again, I want you to keep in mind the fact that I am speaking in generalities. This is not a history course. I'm just trying to give you an overarching sense of the treatment of women, the treatment of Moors, the understanding that Shakespeare is adopting. We're gonna use this background knowledge to help us interpret Shakespeare's play and understand the arguments, the ideas, the messages that he's conveying through it. In the next series of lectures, we're going to actually start delving into Shakespeare's play, Act 1, Scenes 1 and 2.